So uh, thank you for coming. My name is Tom Easton. I'm uh, an editor with The Economist magazine. Um, there are two reasons for you to be here tonight. The first and most important is to revel in the intelligence of your classmates. Um, and there's a part that relies on you as well as on them. And then the second is to prepare your mind for the issue that may be the single most important issue for the years ahead. Um, so let me go back to your responsibilities. We're going to have a 15 minute break in the middle where you are gonna ask questions. It's not a break, excuse me, a Q and A. Um, I would mm -hmm. like you to ask questions. Questions will be limited to 15 minutes in total, but your question will each be limited to 30 seconds. And I would like them to be broad enough so that both sides could take 30 seconds to answer your questions. Um, those of you who, answer, who ask intelligent questions will be given extra pizza. Um, those of you who don't ask any questions at all will have your pizza taken away. So um, with that, I would like the debate to begin. Um, let me call to the uh, podium um, the first pro opening statement. It's by Olivia Hunter, a, sing a senior from, uh, on ter from Vancouver, Canada. Uh, Olivia, you have um, how many minutes do you? You have four minutes for your statement. <laughs> oh, excuse me, I'm going to break in one more time. One of the requests the debaters made is for you all to rest assured that the statements that are being made by these debaters mm -hmm. are not necessarily mm -hmm. reflective of their views. This is an intellectual exercise in which they may coincide with what they're saying, but they're really trying to make the most compelling arguments that they possibly can for any case. So please take that. And when you ask your questions, the same rules will apply. We don't expect that your questions necessarily have to reflect your views. Okay. So before we get into the argumentation, it's important to frame this round so we're all on the same page about what exactly we're debating and why. A debate about major tech companies is really a debate about data. Because practically speaking, tech companies are data companies. Tech giants provide a service to their users in exchange for taking their users' data and monetizing it. In all other aspects of business, these tech companies are regulated just the way any other industry is. But in terms of data practices, such as how the data is aggregated and what is done with that data, these aspects are thoroughly underregulated. So in today's debate about regulating tech giants, we're really focusing on where underregulation is occurring, data. For us, regulation will look something like the EU GDPR, which is legisla legislation around tech data management in Europe, which is about to come into effect. The GDPR states that companies must disclose everything they are doing with someone's data, inform them of their rights to opt out of their data being processed, monetized, or stored, and um, prohibits the use of algorithms and profiling to make decisions about people based on their data. But as we are debating in the United States, and not in the EU, I want to start off the main portion of this debate by discussing um, the American legal precedent for the regulation of data and how that applies to tech. That precedent comes in the form of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. HIPAA regulates how health data is disseminated, managed, and kept private. Under HIPAA, health data must be kept secure by the institutions that collect and use it, and any data that leaves these institutions must be totally de-identified. HIPAA was put in place for two reasons. First, because health is an essential service, and second, because it was recognized that the data contained in health files could be devastating should it become public. Not only would the disclosure of personal health information make it difficult for an individual to get insurance or a job, but other personal information that health insurers have access to, such as your social security number, your payment information, your address, could all be, are all very private and could be potentially devastating in the wrong hands. The precedent of protecting this data is thus met by tech because it fits these two criteria. First, participation in, this company, in these companies are not optional in today's society. You might be able to avoid some companies, but tech giants are a major part of how we engage in society. Getting and maintaining a job requires using a major email service, um, using Google to look up information you don't know, having a phone to text and call your coworkers and clients, and often a form of social media so that employers can perform a background check on you before hiring you. With every, with every generation, the expectation of being connected grows, and this connection can't occur in a vacuum. It must be provided by these tech companies. In a world where everyone must use these services, the status quo leaves everyone's data exposed, and the government has an obligation to protect the vast majority of its citizens. 
Second, tech data has the potential to do undue harm to users should that data be released or sold. Data such as your credit card information, address, GPS location history, communication history, security question answers, could all cause incredible harm to people should they be released. It could allow for your identity to be stolen or fraudulent debt to be run up in your name. Release of your location data could allow for the removal of a person's sense of safety and privacy. Any of these harms cost time, money, and often extreme emotional distress and have devastating consequences. We as a society recognize that large data holders have a phenomenal amount of power. The data they hold could literally destroy real people's lives if in the wrong hands. We invite you to be skeptical of a company that has unchecked power, and we invite you to be skeptical of a side opposition that defends these companies' ability to sell and trade people's lives without people's consent. Thank you very much. One shift to the uh, structure. When there's 30 seconds left, I'm going to say 30 seconds very quietly. So if you can hear it, um, that one may have run a little bit long. That was my fault as a moderator, but I'll be telling you in the future of that. Thank you very much for your comments. But the second speaker will be uh, opening will be by Albert Chen, a sophomore um, from New Jersey. Before I begin with our points, I want to address the HIPAA precedent that Proposition provides. HIPAA is for a different context, so the expectation of data privacy there do not apply to the ones here. Access to data is a more important and salient source of innovation in the modern day with AI and predictive algorithms, and HIPAA was written in a different time for a different industry. Today, restrictions in data access in any industry hold back innovation, but despite this, HIPAA still works in healthcare for two reasons. Firstly, the stakes in healthcare are much higher. They're frequently life or death. Meanwhile, the vast majority of online data we generate is relatively low stakes. And secondly, medical treatment and care have personal, ethical, and moral dimensions that far exceed those of typical tech services. With that addressed, I move on to the point I want to present to you today which is that what we on opposition tell you is that people have no valid expectation of privacy in the digital sphere from the private companies that produce that digital sphere. And if a government regulates based upon this non-existent claim, harms to privacy, harms will arise. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that people can't be attached to their privacy or that people can't be hurt by breaches of their privacy, but these aren't justifiable grounds for new government action, especially because in the status quo, individuals can act in ways to protect their own privacy by choosing to use more secure tech services like WhatsApp or Telegram, and they can seek recourse against those who have harmed them by releasing their data or accidentally letting their data go unsecure, if you see the class action suits that are currently occurring against Equifax and Facebook. So although people may be anxious about privacy, this anxiety does not signal an expectation of privacy. What it actually signals is an inability to adapt to a new digital social compact that will go away with time. What I tell you is that the services provided by tech giants give us unprecedented access to the public sphere. We can access content, services, and resources generated by uh, other people and maintained by other people, and increasingly in the age of AI, done so by other people's data as well. We've never before had this level of access, and it's something that we've actually come to expect. The idea conjured by proposition that these services are essential should suggest to you that a broadly held norm of openness of information already exists. And the degree of one's involvement in the public sphere and the benefits you reap by being integrated into that public sphere must be matched by commensurate losses in privacy. They've always been done so and there's no reason it shouldn't apply in the digital sphere. You cannot reasonably expect the rest of the world to yield more information to you and to benefit from that and then be surprised to, uh, when you are expected to yield more information to other people. What we tell you is that anxiety about privacy in the digital sphere is merely a mismatch but between what we want from society and what society or what we want from society and what society expects from us. This is a mode of free riderism and government should not act upon it because it justifies and enables the kind of belief that you can benefit from the digital public sphere yet remain cut off from it. And this belief is harmful for three reasons. First, it's unrealistic in a digital age. Technology is going to keep moving on openness and we shouldn't enable people to hold on to past norms that don't apply in the future. Secondly, we tell you that cutting off your data is actually harmful in many ways to social progress. This is something that Zach will address that's especially important given the dynamics and the type of innovation the tech industry uh, pursues. And finally, it creates inequalities in access to technology. 
What we tell you is that the business model of technology companies is one that exchanges high quality free online services for data. And that tech advertising is only lucrative because online advertising is specific. It has high conversion rates and is more effective than traditional modes of advertising. And it only accomplishes it by uh, co like collecting large amounts of data about you. Now, if one person decides to cut off their data, it's unlikely to present a whole issue. But a society in which people feel entitled to hoard their data is one that undermines the business model. Tech companies will be motivated to sell their services for actual money, which hurts consumers, particularly the poorest among us, who the open free internet has most benefited. Perfect timing. OK, uh, the response will be by Connie Lee, um, a senior from Houston. People often see government regulation and market competition as dichotomous. But Facebook users deleted their accounts in droves after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So even if data helps improve tech services, that just doesn't matter if people don't feel safe actually using the services. So we're advocating for regulations that inform companies how they're accountable for user data, rather than waiting for a scandal to happen like we've been doing in the past and then figuring out responsibility ex post facto. Olivia's speech told you why tech meets the legal standard for data regulation. In this speech, I'll go more in depth into how data is exploited and why regulation is appropriate. So first, contrary to how the opposition side just characterized digital privacy, data is actually used far beyond what people can consent into. Tech companies collect intensely personal data. This is so normalized that people don't question giving up data like location tracking to localize advertising, credit card numbers to run Facebook Marketplace, even seemingly innocuous data that can unlock security questions to bank accounts. But this data has so much power that of course people feel unsafe when it's given to third parties without their consent. So this is where I just don't think that Albert does enough, right? Just obviously Facebook is not a hospital, that wasn't our point with HIPAA, but we're saying that the principle behind why we want to regulate things that have this much power and why people have the right to data that can have huge effects on them means that there should be more regulation. So to take the most recent example, Cambridge Analytica was collecting Facebook data about people's demographics, friends, and interests, and using it to generate shockingly accurate psychographic profiles about them. The Trump campaign then used these profiles of personalities and beliefs to target voters specifically. This is completely different from what users initially consented into when they put up some information for their friends to see on Facebook. The problem is that tech giants collect data on an entirely different scale from anything else, so consumers do not have the familiarity to be able to give tacit consent. We might expect grocery stores to track our shopping habits or something, but that's it. Similarly, we might sign up for Facebook thinking that their servers might get data on our interests and friends and things that are reasonable. But data sharing and centralization among the tech giants actually means that Facebook knows what you bought on Amazon, what you searched on Google, like who you matched with on Tinder, and all of this information for your friends and family. This scale of information has huge consequences. Cambridge Analytica influenced an entire US election, and every day companies are manipulating your purchases and your political votes based on information that you didn't know that you were giving them in the first place. But even without scandals, People just feel uncomfortable with this level of data because it violates a right to privacy. So side opposition is right to point out that digitization has changed our expectations of privacy, but it shouldn't destroy it completely because Facebook posts are intended for our friends, not for corporations, not for Steve Bannon. Privacy is fundamentally important because you express yourself differently or not at all when you don't trust who is in your audience. And safe self-expression is crucial to how we define ourselves. The second point in the speech is that government regulation is the appropriate way to moderate these impacts. It doesn't need to be enforced perfectly in order to achieve the effects of standardizing how companies use information, giving users greater transparency, and holding companies accountable for violations of that trust. So obviously data is helpful for a company, companies, Albert tells you that, we agree. But we allow targeted ads as long as people consent to giving the information that they're based on. We don't think ads will go away as a revenue source because they're still lucrative, but we think that advertising should change to be based on less harmful aggregations of data. And we think that companies will actually get better data when people trust that service instead of just going off the grid. Even if regulation means that targeted ads will be less accurate though, we think that it's more important to protect data and inform consumers. Any profit lost is a market correction that forces companies to finally internalize the externalities that come from data misuse. 
So even to any degree that regulations slow innovation, we'll bite that bullet because innovation is only good if it actually helps people. And that doesn't happen if people don't feel safe using those services that can improve their lives. Hmm. Perfect timing again. Thank you very much. Um, our third speaker will be Zach Johnson of East Greenwich, um, Rhode Island, and he will be opposed to the motion. Oh, let me just say, did I ever read the motion? Let me, uh, <laughs> well, that was, I made two mistakes on this. This House believes tech, I think it should be very clear to you which way the motion goes. <laughs> but this House believes tech giants should be heavily regulated. And the side over here isn't obviously arguing in favor of regulation. In fact, these debaters are so skilled that all the rest is superfluous. But let me go back to Josh then for your rebuttal. Excuse me, Zach, for the rebuttal. Ladies and gentlemen, remember that this is not a debate about data privacy. This is a debate about federal government regulation as the answer to data privacy. And I'm here to stand before you and say that government regulation, especially federal government regulation, is not the answer. The government is uniquely ill-suited to addressing these challenges for a couple of reasons. First, the government lacks technical expertise. The US Senate finally got Mark Zuckerberg to testify in front of them alone recently. One of the first questions asked Mr. Zuckerberg was, how does Facebook make money if users don't pay for their service? These are the type of people that would be asked to control the future of data privacy for years to come. They're not equipped. And even in government where they are equipped, the NSA showed us that they have the expertise and desire to use and maintain far more pervasive records than any tech company ever has. The second reason that the government is ill-equipped is because the government is incredibly slow-moving. Think about gun control. So many people care so passionately about this issue, and yet nothing gets done. Now apply that process to an issue that no one really understands, and that there is a vested monetary interest uh, against you, and that evolves each and every day. It simply won't work and will not be effective. The third reason the government is ill-equipped is because the government is filled with bureaucracy. Any time you try to regulate against a vested monetary interest, it takes time, effort, and money. The antitrust suit against Microsoft took 20 years to conclude. 20 years! And that saps resources, not only from the tech giants, which need these resources to drive the innovation that will fuel our future, but also from small, growing, agile companies that could be the tech giants of next year. And it might even inhibit their growth to become that or force consolidation into even more of a tech monopoly than already exists. The final reason that the government is ill-equipped is because meaningful change has to happen and does happen naturally. As we speak, Facebook is dramatically shifting their privacy policy and changing how they store data. That happens not to just comply with some regulation, but in a good spirit effort to change the culture of their company. That only happens when and if consumers say, we care about privacy, change this. And that does not need regulation to happen. And finally, I want to talk about why regulation could actually be really bad in the terms of artificial intelligence, because there are two quirks about our artificial intelligence. The first is that the, is that the decisions that it makes are often unexplainable to the engineers running the algorithms. <laughs> Additionally, it also relies upon the data sets that are fed into the algorithms to unlock its potential. Companies will always sell targeted information because it is too lucrative not to do so. It's the reason why Facebook and Google are giants. They will always use the available information to create detailed profiles of who you are. The smaller the sample size and the more random the data points, maybe by people opting out or restricting the information collected, the more inaccurate these data sets become. And when you make unexplainable decisions based on inaccurate data, you entrench discrimination in the future of our technology for years to come. Thank you. Um, perfect timing. So uh, all the speakers have had one chance. We're going to go back to rebuttals. But um, let me ask you, when you walked into this room, how many of you uh, were in favor of the House's motion, which was tech should be regulated? How many were opposed to this regulation? 
How many of you feel that given what you've heard, you might be shifting your side? Oh, this is a wonder. Okay, so we are reaching the next round, and basically the victory is in either one of your hands. It is not clear who will, so you have to bring this home. Okay, so uh, we're going to have the uh, pro rebuttal for uh, one half rebuttal mm -hmm. by Olivia. Do you need that? Yeah. The opposition presents to you some incorrect assumptions on their side of the house. The first claim that they make is that people do not expect to have data privacy online. People know that if they post in a public forum, the entirety of the internet can read what they're saying. But even on the internet, some interactions in some places are still seen as mostly private. Personal communication with the friends on a private Facebook page is still seen as something that is between you, the person you're communicating with, and maybe the company that runs the app that you're using. People do not, however, have the expectation that this information will be sold or shared beyond that. When, when men put their HIV status on Grindr, they did that to be honest partners and did not expect Grindr to share that personal health data with other companies. People should know where else their data is going and have the choice to opt out because their data has the chance to harm them should it become public. The second thing that they brought up is that you shouldn't be able to benefit from the collective goods of technology while opting out of, from participating in these collective goods. We tell you that there are a lot of collective goods that cannot exist without a critical mass of participants, and yet we still people let people opt out of them. Voting is one of them. We can't have a democracy unless people vote, but we don't tell people that don't vote that they cannot have the benefits of democracy or mandate that they must vote and be part of the collective. The third big idea that they bring up is that these companies having access to less data will lead to bad AI. At the end of the day, these tech companies care about revenue, which is mainly comes through advertising, and AI is used to generate targeted ad placements. When users can opt so only the data they want to share enters this AI advertising, advertising will actually improve. This is because the algorithms making assumptions based on reductionist qualities like race and age and sex, instead of this, the person will actually be telling the data companies and advertisers what aspects of themselves they think are most important to provide products to them and what products they are actually most likely to click on and buy. Because more clicks on ads leads to more revenue for these companies, which is good for them. And while there is a chance that some people will be risk averse and give no information, these are the same people who would have quit paying Facebook and the status quo because they're afraid of the big data. We tell you it's better for big tech's business that consumers stay in their network but opt out of giving up their data than to exit the network altogether. The fourth and last thing opposition discussed is that just because companies won't want to comply and might circumvent regulation, that means we shouldn't try and regulate it at all. As a society, we do not function under the mandate that just because we cannot be perfect does not mean that we should not try. We believe that it should be, it's illegal to, or sorry, we believe that it's bad to steal things and we have laws that say you shouldn't do that. There are still thieves. That doesn't mean that we should make stealing, illegal, stealing legal because people steal things anyway. If we didn't update the laws as technology changed, we would still have things like revenge pornography and cyberbullying be totally legal and that's like not okay. We ask you to keep these things in mind as we continue on with our debate today. Thank you very much. Um, the next one will be Albert. <laughs> By the way, I hope you're preparing your questions because that's coming up. So I want to bring a few points in response to what Proposition has told you guys today. Firstly, with the idea that, we sh that uh, the government shouldn't enforce contribution to public goods. What we believe is the government is actually obliged to enforce contribution to public goods. Government exists to take care of collective action problems, and where under circumstances that the collective action might lead to failure that hurts society, government is obliged to intervene or not intervene in this circumstance in a way that makes sure that a collective action problem doesn't happen. 
Secondly, we don't necessarily believe the profiles generated by these tech companies are reductionist at all. Rather, the proposition told you themselves that Cambridge Analytica created eerily accurate psychosocial pro profiles of people, which doesn't actually sound that reductionist in the first place. And we actually think letting people categorize themselves according to the way they think they are ends up leading to more inaccurate and reductionist tendencies. We don't believe that people actually have accurate self-images of themselves. And thirdly, we don't think that, uh, that, there, that the government is tied down uh, to these circumstances uh, that proposition brings to you. What we tell you is that the government is a mandate not to cause harm to society. And under these circumstances that they bring you, government will cause harm by creating discrimination and inequalities in access to technology. Now into some additional constructive points for ourselves that further develop our idea, ideas, and I think proposition drops. Firstly, we think that the idea of basing this regulation upon a concept of consent is flawed. Because when people consent to the use of technology, they're only capable of doing so and knowing to how they would respond in, in their state of consent to ex post facto. Here's how most people think. If a technology service collects data and uses that without my consent right now and uses it for a purpose I deem useful and then I see that afterwards, then I'm not going to express any objections. I have consented to it in my mind. And if a technology service collects my data and uses it for another reason that I deem perhaps harmful, I do express objections. But other than those circumstances, recognize that it's very hard to see what's actually useful versus what is harmful. These are subjective categories that can actually change depending on the circumstances. Take, for example, the idea of location tracking, right? I might feel that the technology company is intruding upon my own privacy by tracking my location wherever I go. But as soon as my phone gets stolen, I would really love if my company could perpetually track my phone. Notice that social circumstances dictate the consent that we provide. We don't think people can effectively opt into technology collecting their data. Secondly, we think on the point of business model, we think that proposition misconstrues the nature of technology. We think that you do need all of this data to drive future innovation because the potential of AI to achieve great things is so tremendous, as well as potentially harm by enshrining discrimination. And by not allowing companies to freely exchange and share their data, you're reducing the amount of data that's available them, uh, to them to innovate. And even if this innovation does occur, the lack of free exchange means it's gonna be concentrated in the most powerful tech giants that now control our society, leaving us open to their own potential abuses and preventing the emergence of competition. Thank you so much for listening to us today. We're now, thank you very much. Um, questions. So we're going to limit questions to 30 seconds and they should be open. There's our first question. Could everyone raise their hand who has a question regard, oh, this is good, to more pizza for you, more pizza for you. Anyone, I hope there are a couple more questions in the crowd. Any over here? Think of one, I will get to. Okay. All right. Can you hear Wait me? Wait a second. Just pause for one second until they're out there. Um, okay. Again, one more shot on who has questions after this person here? There is, yeah, they're over there. Okay. Fine. Cool. Beginning so something I heard from <clears throat> neither side today Could you identify was that, yourself? sorry? Just identify yourself. Name. Oh, I'm Jimmy Fair from Denver, Colorado, senior. Senior. Um, something I heard from neither side today um, was that all of these, or most of these tech companies, these big uh, tech companies, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, they have one thing in common, that's that they're American. So do you think that the fact that here in the United States we have less regulation contributes to the fact that uh, these companies exist with such dynamic force in the first place compared to our European counterparts? So let me turn first to the uh, pro side. Um, yeah, so I think the history of technology in the U.S. is pretty interesting because we are pretty low regulation and that's something that was really important when tech was starting out because it helped them innovate, get the effects that they're talking about. I think the point where right now um, the five biggest U.S. firms are all tech companies shows that we're kind of past the point where that innovation is continuing to be more helpful than it is, or that lack of regulation is continuing to be helpful in that specific context. Like back then we did it because there were little market influence that those companies had. Now there's a lot and that has social implications that do need to be regulated. Um, obviously this debate is American centric right now because we are in America, but we're happy to also say that normatively this should apply to like how China regulates companies like, you know, ZTE and, uh, Ten cent and whatever. Awesome. I think you bring up a really important point because uh, when comparing the United States to China, these are the two countries that will be the future of the artificial intelligence race. And this will mark the technology as we go forward. And the advantage that China has now is that not only do they fund it more, ac more actively than the United States does, but it also has less regulation. 
And if we let China, as the, as the United States, if we let China define what the artificial intelligence future will be, we lose the control to, find, to define artificial intelligence in ethical, very helpful ways. And that, I think, is a very dangerous prospect and one that I think we should avoid. Thank you very much. Next question. Identify yourself, just name and what year you are. Where yeah, hi. Um, my name is Matt. I'm a junior, rising senior from New York. Uh, so one thing that the opposition brought up was that um, in hindsight to how some technology is used, there are occasions where uh, they're against how it was used and respond as such, or they were for how it was used after the fact and respond as such, which makes it seem like this issue is almost a protection-based um, issue versus a reaction-based issue, whereas, and up until this point, it seemed like uh, we live, we are operating under a pretty reaction-based system to things like Equifax and Cambridge Analytica. So my question really is, um, in in that context, what what matters more? Do does it make sense to continue in the reactionary um, way, given some of the downfalls that we've seen so far? Or does it make sense now to transition to something protectionary given the number of those things that have occurred? So let me just be clear. Are you clear with the question? Can you yeah. handle that question? Yes. So I'm going to start with the con side, and then I'll go to you. Okay. Yeah, so I think you bring up an, extra po uh, an excellent point. And what I was trying to say there is essentially that the mode in which we interact with technology is only really conducive to a reactionary mode of re uh, regulation. That is to say, a protection mode of regulation would completely ignore a lot of the qualitative aspects that end up changing our mind thereafter and end up creating circumstances where we would chafe against that regulation and that regulation would cause us harm in circumstances that we wouldn't want to desire. I think we only the only reason we think reaction is bad because reaction only happens after bad things happen, right? But the problem with protection that's so negative is that all of the little bad things that you see accumulate, you never see them accumulate. They'll never be talked about. And I think that's one of the flaws that's on the side of regulation. Olivia? I think the important thing to realize is that people want protection after the fact. Like something happens and then they realize that, oh dang, I wish I had had this protection beforehand. And I think the reality is on our side of the house, we're not advocating that no data be collected. We are advocating that people choose when and how their data is collected. So if you want to put find my phone as the one thing on your phone that tracks your location data and is like accessible, that's totally fine. If you want all of your data to be accessed, that's great too. What we're giving is people the choice to decide at what point their life is like belongs to this data company and at what point it is theirs. Next question. Thank Hi, you very I'm much. Michael Bodak, I'm a junior from New York. And I think late in this debate has been the theme about whether the government can regulate tech or whether the free market can regulate itself. So the question I have to both sides is, is there adequate competition in the market? And if a firm were to overstep, can a new player enter the field? Great. So um, I'm not sure which side to go to first. Who would like to take that first? Would, uh, we would you'll take it? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I would like everyone to have then another chance to have it if there are not sufficient questions. So please. Okay. I think it's important to recognize that like these companies take up an enormous amount of market share. Um, and as such, um, they aren't really in threat from any other company for coming in and taking over that market share. You might have small companies come and start to make a splash, but then they're often bought up by these bigger companies. Like companies like Instagram, which was maybe a threat to Facebook, is now owned by Facebook. As such, we tell you that regulation is the way to do this because there is not enough market pressure in order to keep these companies in check. Yeah, so I think uh, a point that Zach brought up is that there is social pressure on these companies, and these companies are actually quite, they've proven themselves quite responsive to that social pressure at the end of the day to react to it. So the question you actually have to ask yourself is not whether there's enough competition in the market uh, to, that, would, that would cause companies to self-regulate, but whether regulation would actually enshrine further market power, because I think we're at a state right now where it's in a gray zone, but I think that regulation would further put that over the door. I mentioned an argument earlier about how the regulation of these companies is more likely to cause uh, technological innovations to accumulate into their hands, more likely to cause congregation, and that pushes us towards a world where it's more, uh, even less likely that competition and social norms guide company policy. Question over here. Uh, hello, my name is Joseph Regan. I'm a junior from Barrington, Rhode Island, and I wanted to ask if absent government involvement or regulation in tech, there's a possibility of consumers or corporations becoming somewhat uh, beholden to cybersecurity firms. 
which I feel like are ultimately responsible for your security online or with your data. Wait a second, could you repeat the end of your question? Uh, is there uh, some sort of way that companies or consumers are going to become beholden to cybersecurity firms? To cybersecurity firms. The government has no role. Okay, uh, Connie, would you like to? Would you like to take this or should I start on? No, I can take it. Um, no, I just think that's an interesting question because that obviously requires a lot of speculation. I do think that cybersecurity, as we've seen it, has not done enough to check the role of these companies and their interactions with consumers. And I think the reason why is because, as Olivia kind of alluded to, the companies have enough power and there's no, like, I think the threat of government regulation is actually probably uh, one thing that can unilaterally check um, the power of these companies. Because when like things like market share decrease or like um, cybersecurity, there are ways to get around that. Uh, whereas for government regulation, like there is much more of a sense that there are great penalties for not adhering to that. I think that there is some way in which the government should at least like play a uh, partner with cybersecurity firms or like still have regulations on top of anything that any regulation that might come from that. Would you like to take that side? Sure. Uh, I think it's really important to examine the actors you want responsible for setting the features of data privacy moving forward. If you look at the government versus cybersecurity firms, I would argue that cybersecurity firms not only have more expertise, but are more adaptable. And um, combining those two and trying to mesh inexpertise and slow to change with a lot of expertise and quickly to change would chafe at the bounds of that relationship and would cause a lot more problems than it would help. Um, this is a, uh, I'm allowed to be part of the cross-examination. I had thought that you had said um, originally, um, would these firms be beholden to government rather than beholden to cybersecurity firms? Um, it was my misunderstanding of your question, but I'd like to put that to the two sides too. What is the possibility that by regulation that these firms become beholden and therefore tools of the government and does that create a threat? Who would like to take that on this side? Yeah, I think the odds of that happening are actually incredibly high because once you have a regulatory regime which causes these companies to force themselves to check in with the government all the time and contribute all this data, it allows the government to push them around in all kinds of ways and it creates kind of this sector in the marketplace for them to attempt to manipulate the government and it's in this rent-seeking sector that this beholden, that you can kind of see a revolving door kind of happen in which government and these firms uh, start to intermingle. So I wouldn't necessarily describe it as much beholden but a situation in which these sectors actually start to mix in a way that's actually quite negative for the rest of society. Yeah, whoever. Yeah, whoever I got it. So I'd like to turn attention back to like HIPAA as a precedent here. Yes. So what I tell you is like the government regulates health data and how it is like disseminated and used, but that doesn't mean that health data is like the property of the government or that the health companies like are the government's actors. We tell you that like these companies can exist even if they are beholden to the regulations of these of um, of the government. We tell you that like innovation exists even when beholden to the regulation of the government. We see this in heavily regulated sectors such as the pharmaceutical companies, such as food companies. We tell you that when people's safety is paramount, companies should have to adapt to that and be beholden to the consumer at government regulations behest. Hi, um, I'm Priya. I'm a junior from San Francisco, California. Um, my question is, I, the Bill of Rights has certain protections for certain types of privacy against unreasonable searches and seizure, privacy of the home, you don't have to house soldiers, um, but it doesn't have really a, a universal privacy right. Insofar as people don't necessarily explicitly have that right, they're welcome to trade away, you're welcome to tell people your location data or other data. Um, so my question is, considering that a lot of companies have terms and conditions that explicitly tell the consumer that their data belongs to the company in question, um, how do you account for this behavioral issue and how do you protect that? Um, first, so I do think the Fourth Amendment implies some kind of right <laughs> to privacy. That's the stock response, so I'll give it first. But also I think, um, First, like just legally, right? The government can regulate commerce and things that have societal impacts. And I think something like Cambridge Analytica just shows that this isn't just about the individual right to privacy, although I think that's certainly relevant, but also about the social consequences that come from like a mass violation of that right. I think that's closer to what we're talking about because, like, if you can get nitpicky and say that, like, perhaps people do, you know, click through these terms and agreements, etc. But I do think that normatively, the government does have some kind of role in making the situation better if it just is clear that there is some kind of coercive way. In 
in which people don't really know that they're uh, like their Facebook posts are being turned into like literal profiles of them that are being used by people that they didn't expect. Yeah, so I think kind of also to give a straight stock response, while the Fourth Amendment guarantee uh, has some kind of right to privacy installed in, I think that's only a right to privacy with respect to the government, not with respect to these private parties. So I think that's the first issue to consider. And secondly, I think that we've already seen third party solutions to this behavioral issue of terms and conditions emerge. If you just look up like ways to simplify terms and conditions, there's nonprofits and websites which evaluate these terms and conditions and put them into plain English and give them nice color coding to you so you can see what degree you're handing over your information. So I think even in, in the absence of government regulation, you see private solutions, and that really shows the adaptivity of the technology marketplace to the behavioral problems that face it. Other questions? Yes, back here. Hi, I'm Will. I'm a sophomore from Connecticut. Uh, I was wondering what your guys' opinions are on the interaction between the motivations between, er, for these companies, whether they're more motivated by bettering their total social welfare or uh, their stockholders. Which, uh, let's, would you like to go first? One? Sure. Or would you like the, would you like the opposition to go first? <laughs> I have no preference. I can go first. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's important to recognize that at the end of the day, if um, companies do not produce revenue, they stop existing. So it's their first and foremost priority to produce like the best bottom line for their shareholders so they can continue to exist, continue to innovate, and continue to take home money. Um, we tell you that social welfare often like allows them to do that because if they, your consumers like you, you're more likely to buy. But at the end of the day, they are most motivated by the profit. And as such, that's why these exploitative advertising, exploitative da data sales will continue to happen when these companies are unchecked because that is the most lucrative way that they are getting money now. I think you have to consider the competition between these data and tech giants because they are operating at such a large scale that in order to effectively compete with each other, they have to redefine helpful and effective products for their consumers that make a mass positive impact for these individuals. And in order to do that, in order to pursue revenue and the greatest amount of revenue, they also have to pursue the greatest amount of social welfare just because of that very large scale. So I think in this very limited context, those two are actually the same goal in many ways. Are there more questions or if we, I don't see any other questions. Okay, I think some of those exchanges were fantastic. Um, let me go to the conclusions. Um, we're going to begin with the, um, um, <clears throat> with Connie, with the pro closing remarks. Uh, wait for one second, yeah. Thank you very much, okay. So earlier I told you a little bit about the history of why there is little regulation on these tech companies, but the problem is that those regulations have not changed since it became the case that Google, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook are the five largest companies in the US. So we're advocating for greater regulation because we think that Cambridge Analytica, Equifax, and other scandals that have happened recently have shown us that, first of all, these are going to continue, and secondly, it's time to stop exempting corporations from social responsibilities just because they also produce technology. So we think side opposition just sort of rests their case on the idea that data will get worse and we like data. But first, I think we've shown you that no, data won't necessarily get worse, right? Because better data is data that people consent into and give relevantly about themselves. For example, a lot of times now targeted ads are based on race because that's an easily accessible piece of data. But I don't think people want race targeted ads at them, right? Like that's a little uncomfortable for a reason. We think that people would rather be able to input their interests and input the information that they would actually like ads and information targeted at them. And that if you get all the benefits that Albert tells you, right? If people think that find my iPhone is so great, then we think that people will consent into providing the information that gives those services. So also secondly, we just say that at the end of the day, innovation is instrumental to actually helping people. So again, Cambridge Analytica might have built accurate profiles, but if people feel really creeped out by them, then they're probably not going to want the trade-off that happens, even if it gets you to something better in the end. So what do we tell you? We tell you that tech companies should need to ask for consent before they sell your data. They should inform you of, your data of their data collection pr practices. And we say that non-consensually selling data is violative of privacy, makes people feel unsafe, and has uncontrolled social consequences. So if you buy that, then we win the round. 
We say that digitization has become essential to communication, so people have to integrate personal information onto these services. Facebook is how people stay in touch, Google is how you do your homework, but this information comes with the trust that it's being used to achieve those purposes and not being sold to others. So even if the government can't enforce those regulations perfectly, we say that regulations just need to exist. The worst case scenario for our side, right, even if the government totally sucks, we say that it still creates a procedure by which we can hold companies accountable, set standards of privacy and security for society. We say that government inaction emboldens companies that cause data breaches and scandals, and we are proud to propose what needs to be done. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a debate about data privacy. This is a debate about whether you think the government is the entity best equipped to control data privacy for years to come. This is a debate about whether you think your senator has the skills to tangle with Jeff Bezos and Sergey Brin, about whether the US House of Representatives can be as agile as technological change. The other side tells you that a law does not have to be perfect in order to do good, and they're right. Even ill-informed, poorly executed and enforced regulation could make it at least slightly more challenging to collect and sell data. However, at what cost? Revenue loss could make the essential pro products that the proposition references less accessible. Most importantly, bureaucracy and inaccurate data could stifle innovation. This is unacceptable. Facebook and Google's most ambitious products, the ones only possible because of lucrative advertising deals, could bring connectivity to millions in third world countries and pioneer renewable energy solutions. Bureaucracy fosters a monopol monopolistic situation in which these companies don't have to be responsive to consumer demands. Poorly developed artificial intelligence could entrench discrimination for years to come. These costs far outweigh the benefits, especially when consider that the majority of protected data is along the lines of male, Jewish, 54, likes kittens. It's, and that there is already legal recourse for data abuses. For any regulation designed to protect consumers, if the harm of that regulation to consumers is more than the benefits to consumers, it shouldn't be a regulation. So don't let the US government turn Google into the DMV. Let tech companies improve people's lives and respond to consumer demands for privacy on their own and side for the opposition. Thank you. So thank you very much. Clearly the most surprising aspect of this debate is that, let me repeat, the two sides don't necessarily voice opinions that reflect their own opinions. Um, I'm totally persuaded that both sides actually believe what they're talking about. Um, so with that, um, let me uh, call for a vote. Uh, again, the motion is this House believes tech giants should be more heavily regulated. How many in this room are in favor of that motion? Oh my God, this is going to be really hard. And how many are opposed? Oh my God, uh, we're going to have to have a count. I'm, yeah, we're going to have to do a count. I'm sorry. It's so close that it's, it's, um, yeah, how many for, oh, you cannot leave without voting, ma'am. We need your vote. <laughs> Just if you can leave your vote with that person. <laughs> So wait a second, it should, does the House have more heavily regulated? The 17. 17, that is the side that prevailed. Um, congratulations. Now let me just ask, uh, can I get a vote again for when you came into this room, how many were on each side? Uh, how many were for the House motion? This House believes tech giants should be more heavily regulated. Or let me put it to you e more easily. How many of you switch sides? Let me just, oh my God, like the whole room switch sides. All right. Um, this debate was clearly in play until the very end. So you guys did a terrific job, both of you. Um, I thought your answers to the Q&A were particularly um, instructive. Um, I have to say that this is um, a far better, I, in the past week I've been in Washington um, to hear the congressional debate on financial regulation and I've had uh, numerous CEOs in the office and this was a higher level debate than I received for any of those and it was really my pleasure to be part of this. So thank you very, very much. It was a well-argued, well-done debate. <laughs>